A very good afternoon to all of you, distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome to the 21st edition of World Sustainable Development Summit. This thematic track session is on the role of nature in the decade of action of the 2030 Agenda on Sustainable Development, which is held in partnership with Federal Ministry for the Environment, Nat Nature Conservation, Nuclear Safety, and Consumer Protection, Germany, and with the knowledge support from Terry School of Advanced Studies. Before we start the proceedings for the session, I want to start by thanking our partner, BMUE, for giving the research team tremendous intellectual freedom and for all their inputs on making this session a very interesting and innovative one. Our moderator for the session today is Dr. Nandan Non, Professor, Department of Policy and Management Studies, Terry Sass. Professor Non is an economist by disciplinary training, and he teaches courses on the interface of environment, development, and economics. I now hand it over to Dr. Non to conduct the proceedings of the session. Over to you, Nandan. Thanks, Nivedita. Good afternoon, uh, good morning, uh, good evening to all of you, depending on where you are located. It's an indeed a great pleasure to moderate this session on role of nature in the decade of action of the 2030 Agenda on Sustainable Development. As such, uh, this matter is close, pretty close to my heart in terms of role of nature in economic development per se. We know that we are just eight years, close, close eight years to reach to 2030, and many of the targets that worldwide, internationally we have set, be it for sustainable and sustainable development as such, or be it marine ecosystems, or be it sustainable consumption and production, or biodiversity as such, we are not quite close to the target. So the question is, where are we going wrong? Because if we have agreed that this is something that we are going to do together, there must be some reasons. And we are here with a galaxy of practitioners, I would say, who have done the work in this field for many, many years. And we are here to hear, to hear from them what has been their experience in terms of contributions to nature, contributions to nature in fulfilling our agenda of SDG, how to facilitate that. Without spending any further time, I would like to invite Stephen Contius, who is the Commissioner for the 2030 Agenda and Head of Division in Germany Ministry of Environment. As we know that BMUV has been as the lead on many, many areas connected to Action Agenda. So, we would like to hear from him that what are the key challenges and opportunities to implement the SDGs by 2030? Over to you, Stephen. Apologies. Uh, good afternoon and uh, good morning to all who are in this call. Uh, thank you so much. It's a great pleasure to be here today and uh, to speak to this topic. Um, the recovery from the pandemic, sustainable development and the role of nature. In 2015, the world agreed on the 17 Universal Sustainable Development Goals, which are to be implemented by 2030 in line with the 2030 Agenda. We are 
two years now into the decade of action and delivery. And I have to say, unfortunately, we are not on track. Moreover, we see that the pandemic is having negative impacts on the implementation of the SDGs. Many of the problems we see now do not originate from the pandemic, of course. Rather, the pandemic is intensifying problems and inequalities that have their origins in the way we have uh, proceeded in the past. In the past, when the narrative of trade-offs between environmental sustainability and economic growth prevailed. The pandemic has shown us very clearly that we were not on the right track and that business as usual is no longer an option. Now is the moment to make a course correction and change consumption patterns and production processes, lifestyles, in a truly sustainable and inclusive way so as to save resources and emissions. And here lie the opportunities. A green and better economic recovery from the pandemic can truly accelerate our progress towards a climate-friendly, nature-positive and truly sustainable transformation. Last year, Germany presented its second voluntary national review on the implementation of the SDGs at the United Nations in New York and uh, illustrated its revised national sustainable development strategy adopted in March last year. Similar to the Global Sustainable Development Report, the GSDR, and in line with the European Green Deal, our national sustainable development strategy defines six so-called transformation areas, which entail entry points to a much stronger, more integrated approach to SDG implementation in order to overcome deficits. They are first, energy transition and climate action, second, circular economy, and three, sustainable agriculture and food systems, just to name, just to name these three. Instead of thinking in separate areas, we need to find integrated, holistic answers. The German Environment Minister Steffi Lemke said in her speech on Wednesday at this very World Sustainable Development Summit of Terry that the best solutions are those that work simultaneously against the major global environmental crises, as well as against the problems in the everyday lives of citizens. The World Sustainable Development Summit comes at a timely moment. Already in the ministerial sessions, many ministers highlighted the importance of the upcoming United Nations Environment Assembly. It marks a historic year as it is the 50th anniversary of the first ever United Nations Conference on the Environment in Stockholm. It allows us to send a strong signal that global problems need global solutions. It is therefore fitting that, theme, that the theme of the UNAIR is strengthening actions for nature to achieve the sustainable development goals. It highlights the pivotal role plays in our lives and in social, economic and environmental sustainable development. Nature is in the center of our lives. Having just had our new government is putting stronger emphasis on these issues. For my ministry, the environment ministry in Germany, uh, which is also taking care now of consumer issues. This includes focusing on the role of nature and natural sinks in climate protection, circular economy, uh, resource efficiency, and therefore thinking of the crisis of biodiversity and the crisis of climate change in tandem.
I'm pleased that we are working closely with our partners like India on these topics. Uh, India will have the G20 presidency next year and uh, we are very much looking forward to support uh, efforts uh, in India if needed. This event today and this panel reflect the close relationship our two countries have and how much we can learn from each other. Allow me to close by thanking Terry for the organization of the event today, as well as of this very interesting summit. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, for emphasizing two key messages. One is that pandemic has shown us how interconnections are between nature and everyday life of citizens. And the second is that we need a systems approach in order to make things work, in particular nature in the area of economic development or nature for economic development. Certainly, the Germany-India cooperation will pave a long way and it has been in the past towards mainstreaming biodiversity and ecosystem services as such nature in the economic development agenda of India in particular. Uh, certainly, we look forward to many such cooperations. I now request, going to request uh, Simon Zadek, uh, who is the chair in the Finance for Biodiversity Initiative. As we all know, at the end of the day, what matters is that be it ecological restoration, be it biodiversity ecosystem services augmentation, there has to be certain interventions and finance plays a key role. The history that it's a, it's a finance for biodiversity augmentation has a checkered history, some cases, in fact, in India, not just India, but also globally. We have seen in many cases it has been a great success, uh, but in many cases it could not be because of structural as well as functional reasons. It is, I think it is important to hear from Simon about what are the key challenges in making say, commercially attractive biodiversity conservation efforts that will also enhance the well-being of the local population, given the fact that this is, these, are, these population are closest to the resource. Over to you, Simon. So thank you very much indeed. And thanks to Terry and its partners uh, for inviting me to make some opening comments, which I'm very honored to offer. Uh, it's great to follow on from Stefan, a long time uh, colleague uh, and collaborator. So I'm hopeful uh, that this will add um, a little detail in the area that you have pointed to. So um, it's, very common for us all to say that we stand on the historical edge of something um, because it somehow validates where we are or what it is we're proposing to do. And, and I'm going to say the same thing. Uh, I think we stand on an unusual historic edge, which is that we're witnessing a surge in the monetization of nature. And in many ways, this is what we've called for for decades, if not generations, uh, but it remains an open question as to whether that will be the beginning of the launch of a nature-centric economy or a precipice that we're going to fall over into further trouble. And I'd like to offer some remarks in a sense that frames these two different possible pathways of what is to come. I'm going to start with five simple numbers. Um, the first, 100%. We need to remember that 100% of our global economy is 100% dependent on nature. And any other numbers that anyone offers, 30%, um, 40%, 15%, 60%, simply is inaccurate at an important systemic level. My second number is $12 trillion a year. That is the estimated level of negative externalities 
of the world's largest sector, which is the food sector, comprising $8 trillion a year, uh, or more or less 8 or 9% of the global economy. And of that $12 trillion, a major proportion is a measure of damage to nature. My third number, actually emerging from a report that was issued just two days ago, is $1.8 trillion a year. That is the estimate of subsidies around the world each year that are damaging to nature. Fossil fuel subsidies, agricultural subsidies, inappropriate perverse subsidies in the area of forestry and elsewhere. Moving more positively, my fifth number is $19 billion a year, which is the estimate of the size of the sustainable fisheries market by 2025. So we see fisheries, but also many other markets beginning to emerge that are deeply embedded in nature and a reflection of its strength and vitality. And my final number is 40%. The, the fastest growing market in the world today, perhaps to some surprise, is carbon, carbon offsets. And current estimates are that of this surging market, at least 40% of carbon offset opportunities concern nature-based solutions. So the possibilities of monetizing nature and nature assets through the ecosystem service it provides uh, in sequestering, in effect, carbon. Those are but five numbers, but they're trying to give a feel for some of the things that are going on. And I'd like to now just sort of dive in a bit to a little bit more detail. You made the point, finance is key, and of course it is, it's the lifeblood of our global economy. Actually, interestingly, alongside nature, the point I made before. And we have now a decade's experience of trying to integrate climate risk into financial decision-making across global financial and capital markets. And we're now beginning the same journey in the nature space. Over the last year, we've seen the Task Force for Nature-Related Financial Disclosure, TNFD, created essentially to build metrics and disclosure models that investors would need to take into account in considering risks associated with investments that are dependent on nature, particularly when nature is fragile or deteriorating. Uh, and similarly, we begin to see, for example, sovereign credit ratings, uh, not only integrating climate risk, but now for the first time beginning to integrate nature-related risk. Now, risk seems a very negative way of thinking about the world, but it is, if you like, the common currency of the global financial system to price risk in order to ultimately value assets and investment opportunities and drive asset allocation and financial flows. Now, many factors affect these risks. Most obviously, the direct dependency of many of our, in fact, most of our economic assets on nature. And food is the most visible case in point, but any coin you have in your pocket, any phone that you use any day, any glasses you have on your face, let's not forget, are ultimately dependent on nature's bounty. And therefore nature dependency has to be understood in a far more holistic uh, way. Uh, but of course, beyond nature dependency, we also see a wealth of new regulations beginning to emerge, some national, some regional, some cross-border, that are beginning to increase the risks to investors of investing in assets that undermine or destroy natural capital. One example, perhaps unexpected, would be the recent development in any anti-money laundering rules, so specifically about the financial community as they relate to nature crimes and a whole development in work in that area. But we also see many other regulations. We see growing reputational issues as digitalization makes campaigning more and more effective in rendering transparent the linkages between financial flows 
uh, and nature assets and potential damage. And, and at the end of the day, as we've seen in the climate space, we see the emergence of, if you like, the first generation of litigation around nature destruction. Uh, and that will clearly also drive itself into the way in which the investment community understands the value of nature, prices it into its investment decisions and according allocations. So, so far, so good, although this is an early stage in this development. What I'd like to do now is just turn briefly from the financial side of the story to the real economy side of the story, because that's, of course, ultimately where we begin to understand what the opportunities that are emerging might actually look like. I've already mentioned carbon offsets, whether you consider that to be the real economy or not the real economy, there is no doubt that over the next five to 10 years, there will be tens if not hundreds of billions of dollars invested in nature in exchange for acquiring the rights to lay claim to nature's carbon sequestration potential. Now, whether that's good or bad, I'll come back to in a second, but it is undoubtedly the super highway that is going to channel a lot of private capital into nature assets. Uh, but close behind, we begin to see beyond carbon, a whole range of other biodiversity offset markets beginning to emerge. <clears throat> Most obviously in water, largely still within a regulated national context. But talking to many actors in the offset markets, we can expect over the coming years, a wide and confusing range of biodiversity credit markets to emerge. And of course, that raises many questions that are not simply about measurement and equivalence, but really how to govern those markets going forward. And then amidst that complexity, we shouldn't, of course, forget intrinsic nature markets. You know, we trade food, we trade wood, we trade medical products that increasingly have strong nature components. These are the actual movement of natural capital across borders embedded within products. And although we see the very sort of visible side of that, green products, if you like, digitalization, in particular traceability driven by blockchain, is beginning to open the possibility of, of a much more nuanced understanding of what the nature components are of complex products and the valuation of or monetization of nature in that. Your shirt in the future will have a QR code that allows any consumer not only to understand the amount of water in that shirt, but also whether it was legally extracted and where it was legally extracted from. Yeah, that we're moving into a different way of unbundling even the most complex products that we trade and to understand what the nature piece of that really looks like. So all of this and more leads us certainly at Finance for Biodiversity to conclude we are on the edge of a huge surge in nature markets, not just nature embedded in the global economy, but nature with specific revenue flows attached to them, which is how we understand nature markets going forward. Now, does all that add up to a big deal or are we still talking small fry? Now, when we think of the climate space and we think of COP26 in Glasgow, where everybody showed up from every possible multinational and financial institution, clearly part of the reason is that climate has turned into a geo-competitive issue. The clean energy transition in its many manifestations across different sectors is now a major driver and source of competition for which countries and which companies will garner competitive advantage in global markets over the coming years and decades. Climate is now a linchpin driven by technological change and other factors um, in us thinking about really which countries and regions and companies are going to really drive forward in amidst this all important transition. Now, can we really think of the equivalent for nature? You know, we talk about rewilding and we talk about regenerative agriculture and we talk about many wonderful things, but are they really sources of geo-competition? Probably not. 
is the truth. Uh, and so is nature really equivalent to climate in becoming a geopolitical and geocompetitive issue, or will it remain terribly important, but still somehow off of the dance card of the big story of how the global economy evolves? I think the agenda is out, but I would offer perhaps one observation to help us think about that, not only today, but going forward in our individual work. Food is to nature as energy is to climate. And so if we're looking for major transformative geocompetitive areas of development, it is likely to be in the food space. And of course, we know that the food system is on the verge of extraordinary and problematic disruption, that no amount of microfinance is going to help. We know that climate change, uh, food disruption uh, along global value chains, uh, transformation in nutritional needs and access and costs are all part of what we're grappling with at very, very local levels as well as very global levels. And into that mix, of course, comes technological change. Now, you asked me, what does this all mean for local communities? And of course, that often is the question on the table. If we believe, as with clean energy, that the food system transformation that allows it to be nature and climate light um, will involve deep technological change. Think of alternate protein, think of vertical farming, think of the sweeping changes that are coming into a highly complex sector that has largely been technologically light, um, then we have the potential complications uh, that on the one hand, the geocompetitive side of nature could well involve major technological change across the food system. And on the other hand, that may have significant equity implications through the impact on employment, um, through the impact on the cost of nutrition, uh, and the story goes on. So we have inevitably not these trade-offs that are simply coming at us and untouched, but we have these trade-offs that we have to handle through thinking about policy quite carefully. Just a couple more minutes and then I'll pass it back to you. Because in a way, having highlighted some of the upside changes that are happening in financial markets, some of the upside changes that are potentially happening across parts of the real economy and including the food system, it's important that we touch on what I've implied on, which is the associated risks. And it's those risks that leads us not to be unfettered free marketeers, but to think more carefully about the policy and regulatory aspects of these developments as they begin to emerge. Think about carbon markets. Yeah, we have a rush of traders going to little villages in Mexico, perhaps in India and elsewhere, and doing deals in buying carbon offtake agreements, perhaps for 10, 15 years, often with counterparties that are small community organizations, small private owners, perhaps local authorities who have no understanding of carbon markets whatsoever. Yeah, we see a gold rush of purchasing at an average of four or five dollars a tonne, undiscounted over a 10, 15 year period, which is a fraction of what the traders are gonna flip those offtake agreements for in global voluntary carbon markets as they begin to emerge. It's great in a way that we're integrating nature into sovereign credit ratings, but who's gonna pay the price? We've seen with climate risk that as you integrate it into sovereign credit ratings, it's the poorest and most vulnerable climate countries that pay the bill, not Goldman Sachs or anybody else. And the same will happen in the nature space, which is why we have to understand those market dynamics, but also think about what the policy implications need to be, particularly in the area of international competition. And I've already mentioned that if we want a nature-like food system, we may well have parts of the food system becoming technologically far more intense. And that will have implications for the cost of nutrition. It will have implications for employment. And we need to figure out how to manage those trade-offs going forward. So clearly, 
my story um, comes to a close with a fairly obvious warning. On the one hand, we are on the edge of change exactly as we would have asked for. We want to value nature and it's about to take off in space. Yeah, and the question is whether we can manage the way in which that monetization process happens or whether we will again fall foul of some of the weaknesses of market dynamics in what it actually delivers to both society and nature. Last comment, which is finance for biodiversity, as the name suggests, has focused until now principally on finance and the way in which the financial sector works as it relates to nature. But because we see this surge within the real economy now taking off, we have, if you like, extended our lens and next month we'll be launching a task force focused entirely on the growth of nature markets in the real economy uh, with some fantastic partners because we feel this is an area that is fragmented, is not thought of systemically, and which will move very quickly and requires an understanding of its nature, if you'll excuse the pun, and how we as a collective community need to step in. Thank you very much for your time. Once again, it's a real honor to offer some opening comments. Thank you so much. A uh, uh, lot of uh, food and beverages for thought, I would say. Um, I have, uh, I, if I can, I, I, I don't want to summarize it, but uh, I, have an, I, can, I have an alternative hypothesis to offer. Is that uh, so far as integration of risks are concerned, uh, if we BAU continues, then the insurance industry is in for a shock. If we try to integrate the risk in some way or the other, the finance market is in a shock. Why? Because if they have to reveal, if they have to get ESG ratings, they have to reveal where their investments are. And the third is that in case we want financialization, as you rightly mentioned, that financialization of nature, we really don't know where we'll go. So these are the three strengths, right? The insurance agency, insurance industry, on the other hand, the financial products, the, the financial asset finance, and the other is that the carbon offset, nature-based solution, the finance. The strength and weakness of these three will tell us that where the financial world, economic, finance, financialization of the nature will go to. But thank you so much for, for really spelling out where are the fault lines and what are the, I would say, the forks that what you have to address. This is that which way to go, the why is there, we are at the cusp of those whys and there is something that we don't know really where we will go. Thank you so much. It was really wonderful to hear you. Uh, we now uh, move to um, our next speaker, uh, Anshu Singh. Uh, uh, she is with the Ministry of Environment and Forest and uh, she is a statistical advisor. Uh, so she is with us, she handles statistics. And as we know, if we, if we uh, listen to, if you have listened to uh, on the speaker, uh, Stephen, on the question of uh, integration of, uh, uh, on the nature in the SDG agenda, as well as by, of Simon in the integration of the climate risk, you know, data. You need data and you need to, you need credible data. Because if you don't have credible data, it's exactly what the point that Simon mentioned, there will be litigations. So integration of risk requires clear and precise data. And there comes the role of the statistics or statistics or the data collection that has been done in the Ministry of Environment Ministries in all countries, including India. So what do we have, uh, what we can, if we can ask Anshu this question that, uh, that after all, SDG indicators is something that you have to report because of requirements, because of the commitments made by government. Now, if we look at the reporting and monitoring of SDGs, the progress that we have, is that that is going to tell us how good or bad we have been implementing things. Now, what have been your experience in terms of reporting these matters, especially the ones which are biodiversity related, in the sense that biodiversity related to SDG, 
because we know that there are issues related to measurement, related to how we interpret it, and in fact related to secrecy of the data, especially of certain uh, sacrosanct species that we have. Over to you, Anshu. Uh, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity to address this gathering. And I'm really grateful to the earlier speakers who have uh, thrown light on the importance of uh, biodiversity and how it is how nature finance is uh, taking concrete shape and all the challenges that it involves. Now, the specific question in my case is uh, the reporting and monitoring of SDGs. Now, biodiversity is one of the most significant yet challenging components of SDG monitoring. And SDG 15 encompasses a wide range of issues from biodiversity to land degradation to forests. And these are all aimed at the sustainable use of ecosystems. So uh, instead of going to the uh, general uh, aspects, uh, I will straight away go to certain specific examples where uh, challenges have been encountered and uh, what are my views uh, in you know, dealing with them. So uh, if we come to one of the indicators, we have a protected area as a, as a very important concept, which is uh, being reported upon in the SDGs. And uh, here, if we see the protected area indicator in the case of India, it shows only 5% of uh, the geographical area being under protected area. Now, to go deeper into this indicator, we will see that performance of this uh, here defined depends on the data definition as well as the nature of data. Now, the data definition is the definition of protected area. So in the national indicator framework for India, we have taken protected area in very narrow terms. That is only that which has been defined as protected in under the Wildlife Protection Act. But if we go into the broader international definition under the IUCN norms, you will have that this protected area is not just uh, national parks and wildlife sanctuaries. It is also the recorded forest area. It is also that part of the coastal regulation zone where you have significant, uh, you know, significant barriers to doing business. It is also that part of the wetlands which have got the Ramsar site tag. So, and it is also the OECMS. You know? So all these different concepts in the present indicator, they have not been included for the simple reason that the sh in India, the shape files of all these diverse notions, the recorded forest area, the OECMS, they, they become available with a lot of lag. And when we uh, took up this issue with the World Database on Protected Areas, we, uh, uh, we gave the shape files to them. And almost after six months of analysis, they came out that there are certain attributes which are further required to be standardized. So it is not that there is insufficient protected area in the country, but its reporting is a challenge here. So we got into the work of the shape files and whatever attributes were required, we got back to the state governments, to the state forest departments with the help of the Forest Survey of India here and the National Biodiversity Authority, as well as the uh, Biodiversity Division in the ministry to have the standardized way of getting the data cleaned and reported so that the performance of the country is accurately reflected. So uh, this is one of the examples uh, wherein we encountered a challenge and I thought that it should be, uh, you know, really reported. In a similar manner, uh, we have challenges in suppose in the way the wetlands The second kind of challenge that we encounter is at your uh, the periodicity with which the data is reported. That is another constraint which uh, tells us the way how we should go about defining the indicator and measuring performance. For example, wetlands being a very fragile and important ecosystem. In general, the wetland, if we see the overall wetland atlas for the country, 
that is updated on a decadal basis that is on a 10 year basis but if we go in for the status and digitization of the ramsar sites and the wetland health cards these are being do done on an annual basis and the uh, both the reporting as well as the digitization of the shape files that is being uh, done in a on a more regular basis so it is natural for us to define the indicator in terms of the ramsar sites so thus the periodicity of the available data is also a constraint and uh, because here the data quality can be assured that it is from the uh, authoritative institutions the digitization has been done properly and that way periodicity is another challenge which we encounter while reporting and uh, the third kind of challenge that i would like to report is that we have defined say the biodiversity variables at the international levels but these biodiversity indicators in uh, which uh, through the international partnerships they are basically derived from the international data sets for example the protected area representativeness index etc etc that is based on gbif and map of life but when we went deeper into the global data sets we found that the national data sets are far more rich but at there are certain places where they are not geo referenced or they are not in the form in which they can be reported to these international data sets and there is a there, there is a wide gap so this gap remains so even though the inventorization is being taken up very very nicely by the botanical survey of india the zoological survey of india and the wildlife institute of india the censuses are being conducted but still there are gaps vis-a-vis -vis the international data sets and hence what is being reported in the international system may not match if it if the same counterpart is driven from the national systems so uh, and one more point that i will have to make as regarding these sdg performance indicators is that often we ignore the uh, indicators which are related to the means of implementation for example if you have these sdg 15 and 13 most of the you have almost nine indicators in sdg 15 both in, at the global level and the national level and we all try our best to do the performance reporting but often i have noticed uh, both in the national fora and the international fora the means of implementation measures are not given that much of importance and with all that we have heard regarding finance and the transition and all those things how do we actually you know measure progress ensure progress when there is no monitoring of the means of implementation and there should be very uh, you know realistic uh, indicators both at the national as well as international le uh, levels with a uniformity of definition as to what will be the uh, uh, i mean say in climate finance or say in biodiversity finance what is the finance uh, which is required and what are the means of implementation how do we measure that and how we do we measure and report on the progress on these indicators because without a progress on the means of implementation how do we expect a uh, 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 monitoring and progress of the other indicators even then uh, with all the constraints with all the uh, developmental priorities that this country has and with the responsibility of having a mega diverse uh, being a mega diverse country and uh, reporting on these indicators it has taken up the challenge not only to report and improve its data systems but also take up new initiatives we uh, i think even if we uh, go about the tiger reserves the cait is the system of international accreditation and many of our tiger reserves are uh being getting that accreditation so we are open to the international systems of reporting and uh third party accreditation we do not shy away from them but on the same uh, with the, on the same level i would like to argue that the means of implementation indicators of the sdgs should be given the uh the i mean the importance that they deserve and the reporting that uh, that they sh uh, they should be getting both in the national and international fora then of course there can be an analysis between the means of implementation indicators and the other performance indicators just as we link the climate change and biodiversity so also 
we and and uh, pollution so also we must link the means of implementation of those sdgs with the performance on those sdgs that should be a uh, credible as well as a realistic way of going about uh, making progress on the agenda that is not to say that if they are not there we will not try or we will not do it on our own we are doing it we have taken up the challenge as a country both uh, both the uh, prime minister as well as our honorable minister they have emphasized that we have undertaken clean uh, transition clean energy transition and even in biodiversity we have uh, recently uh, added to an our first oecm in the aravalli bio ranges and this trend will continue but as a country we also have to see who is paying for this transition when the nagoya protocol is being implemented implemented then the benefit sharing how is the how are the benefits being distributed are the indigenous people the vulnerable people the people who are at risk those who will be displaced because of these transitions whether planned or because of disasters they are actually being addressed or not how can we change our sdg indicator work both at national and international levels to reflect this and even to motivate these transitions so with that i would like to thank the organizers and all the dignitaries for this opportunity thank you thank you thank you anshu ji for uh, clearly spelling out the challenges that uh, your work especially your department's work faces these are all known and i'm happy that you said this in this platform that means of implementation it is not something that we pay attention to all of us we know in our own organizations and institutions how important these are and how neglected these areas are so we look at the outcome indicators and not the process indicators as we say that and uh, these are well recognized and i'm sure maybe soon there will be a uh, indian uh, forest and uh, environment and forest service just like indian forest service you have maybe they will be giving much more attention to this and there is a call very recent call for having a some kind of a service but again that will be adding much more i would say uh, strength to the monitoring and implementation aspects of sdgs and nature thank you so much um, now uh, we uh, we our next speaker will be lk statements uh, who is uh, with the international cooperation on biodiversity with the dmuv uh, like dmuv has been the partner uh, to terry in this uh, this wsds and i uh, and we know that dmuv has been in the in the process or rather helping the world towards say true nature positive green economy and um, i'm sure there has been challenges so challenges and we have heard a part of the challenges from the first speaker of this session uh, stephen uh, we would like to know about it and that is that uh, say if we want to promote uh, say upscaling of biodiversity conservation or say but as an accelerator for sdg implementation i'm sure there are challenges which you have faced and you have seen why don't you tell us that over to you lk thank you thank you very much um and good afternoon to all of you i'm sending greetings from my home office in cologne would be a great pleasure to meet you in real but this virtual opportunity is is, is still the opportunity we have and it's very very valued thank you for inviting me and actually the question you're posing to me is a quite difficult one um also um it refers of course to what my pre speakers have referred to and uh, many of important aspects have already been highlighted um but let me maybe start with um the um starting point that you already mentioned in your opening words that when looking at the uh, 2030 agenda it's only 8 years to go and i was actually i was tending to say um well by the beginning of this century we were talking um in regards to the year 2020 about a super year for nature um 
yet it was uh, very much um, related to the upcoming conference of the parties of the CBD convention, which was postponed several times, which will, but it will come this year. It will come up this year. So we are in another super year for nature. And especially when listening to my pre-speakers and to your agenda, I think that every year will be a super year for nature. <laughs> And in, super, in, in the same sense, it's a super year of urgency to integrate biodiversity and nature into our economic thinking, into our policies, and um, to mainstream biodiversity into all sectors in order to reach the sustainable development goals. So by having said this, I think, um, I, uh, Simon, if I may address you directly, I very much liked your first number that you raised, the 100%. The 100% uh, uh, relying on nature for economy. I will quote you from today on, <laughs> on this number instantly, because I think it, it really shows the, the real picture. Um, and it's, uh, from my point of view, it's al always very artificial to try to find a percentage of how much of economy is relying on, on nature. It's very artificial. Um, and the fact is it's 100%, not in all senses and not in all levels, but in the whole context, it is 100%. So thank you very much for this number, which I will quote. <laughs> Thank you. So coming now to your question on, on the key challenges um, for a, you called it a true nature positive green recovery. Well, um, this question is very much over overlaid by the pandemic situation, I guess. And this is also the, the aspect uh, that I would like to start with um, commenting. Um, the um, well, intact and uh, intact biodiverse ecosystems are uh, crucial for well-being on the ground, up to national economics, up to the whole economic system through the supply chains. Um, so, through the pandemic, this system um, had been added uh, an additional challenge. I guess, through the pandem pandemic. And um, from our point of view, from the BMUV, as we are um, conducting our bilateral um, work with partners through the ICI, the International Climate Initiative, we um, reacted on this particular um, aspect uh, quite early in the pandemic. And we set up a so-called Corona or COVID response package, which was um, explicitly dedicated to adapt projects under the climate initiative to the circumstances under the pandemic. And uh, one of the responses that uh, projects could take up were economic advisors to support the specific green recovery activities under the projects. So this is just one um, challenge and also one option how to overcome a challenge, um, which is only uh, one highlight. Um, there are several, several other challenges um, that, that uh, are to overcome. Um, but the more interesting question, I think, is if we are so clear about the fact that there are major benefits for nature and they are so obvious, why do we not um, over, overtake them or overrun them? And I guess that um, the special challenges um, lie in the fact that um, investments um, bring about challenges. And this is something that I 
I'm referring to what, what Simon already said. I think there are very high opportunity costs um, when, uh, when you try to stop investing in destruction of nature. For example, investments in mining um, as part of what we might call brown recovery. Sometimes it is exactly uh, the intensification of mining activities that seem to be a solution for the transformation of energy systems that are dependent on minerals, for example, for e-mobility, as well as renewable energies. And in such situations, conflicting objectives and trade-offs between different strategies hamper action. So the knowledge about such trade-offs is the first step of identifying solutions to overcome this dilemma. And in this context, I, I think that also data play an important role. For the private sector, challenges of nature positive recovery lie in the related risk by natural disasters. Intensive, they are um, intensified in frequency and intensity uh, due to climate change during the last years. We, we saw the, um, the horrible floods, the horrible droughts, um, but also um, the existing framework conditions bear risks. So companies, private sector, need a level playing field across countries for investing in nature. That's what we are very, very convinced of. But sometimes also, um, not, not sometimes, but definitely um, it goes along also with the uh, need for clear safeguards from, from natural um, disasters that have to be addressed. Um, Simon already mentioned the Task Force on Nature Related Finance Disclosure. Um, which we appreciate very much in their work. And um, as far as I understand, the TNFD is about to develop a framework for disclosing information on how nature can impact companies as well as how companies impact nature, both sides of the coin. And this framework is intended to help and steer global financial flows away from nature damaging outcomes and toward nature positive ones. And um, actually, um, through the ECI, our financial support instrument, we uh, just had the chance to start a new project building on the TNFD, working, of course, together with it. And it's uh, the, the main objective of the new ICI project is to um, implement this framework in various sectors. Because we think that this is the major step that has to be done to really um, look at the um, specific sectors. And um, yeah, we are happy that we could start this, um, this uh, project just recently together with partners First of all, of course, with the TNFD Secretariat. Well, this um, is just some of the, the, the um, some of uh, the many, many challenges that um, nature positive uh, financing faces. But um, out of coming from my nature, I'm a, a very positive person, so I, I would rather like to talk about the the um, promising ways to upscale biodiversity uh, conservation as an accelerator for the SDG implementation. So um, it, it's uh, again a number <laughs> which uh, is, uh, is um, quite common um, showing that about 80% of the SDG goals and its sub goals are um, explicitly um, uh, working towards the sustainable development goals when looking at biodiversity. I tend to say that after I heard from you, Simon, that economy is 100% uh, related, um, I, I would tend to say that 
100% of the SDGs are related to biodiversity or the other way around. So um, by biodiversity, from my point of view, can definitely be an accelerator for jobs and economic development in many cases, and thus um, reaching the sustainable development goals. And um, I was very, uh, very um, thankful to hear that you uh, pointed also on um, special groups that have a special role in this um, uh, impact as an accelerator. You were talking about the IPLCs. And I think this is really a key, um, also in the context of biodiversity in accelerating the sustainable um, development goals. And I also would like to mention that we um, have understood that also women play a crucial role in this context. And therefore, also in this context, I can, I can mention an ICI project, which is uh, focusing on the specific um, uh, impact that women, for example, have. We have many, many more um, ICI projects also working with IPLC, um, and I'm I do not need to uh, go into details because um, we heard about that already before. Well, um, I'd like to, to mention um, two or three more aspects. Um, many people um, tend to talk only about nature-based solutions when talking about the interconnectivity between um, climate and biodiversity. From our point of view, nature-based solutions are solutions which go beyond biodiversity and climate separately. It's solutions that are there for reaching sustainable development. And having this concept in mind, um, it does not matter too much whether the focus is on climate or whether the focus is on nature, as they serve as possibilities, as solutions for sustainable development. And I, I as far as I've been uh, watching the discussion grow th uh, through the last two decades, maybe, it's very, very good to see that the discussion goes in this direction. But um, from our point of view, um, from the German ministry, we think it even should go beyond this um, interconnectivity of climate and nature, but go beyond and look at the sustainable development goals as a, as a whole and coherent approach. Um, so this is what I wanted to say regarding uh, nature-based solutions. Um, I think that they offer solutions also in a very integrated way. And um, this is the second aspect that I wanted to mention. Um, I think that um, especially mainstreaming biodiversity into different sectors is uh, what gives major opportunities. And um, um, as Antu already uh, were mentioning um, some aspects from, from the forest sector, I can only say that um, from a nature uh, conservation perspective, we have been working with different appro approaches for many, many years, like, for example, the forest and landscape restoration approach or just to name another very prominent approach, um, which is the ecosystem-based adaptation approach. And both approaches are very well established, very well experienced, and they are the ones that make nature-based solutions really alive. And I think this is also a great opportunity to integrate um, approaches into um, different sectors. And um, I think if we we reach that point that ecosystem based adaptation, for example, is is uh, acknowledged as a major approach in different sectors, 
without having the biodiversity aspect at its first sight, then we really, really can um, make a difference. Um, I see your hand and I, I assume that you would ask me to come to an end. <laughs> um, so I just want to highlight a very single point, uh, last point. Um, when having talked about these different approaches that really can make a difference and that show uh, opportunities, um, it's, it's an, there's another approach that I really want to mention, which is not new at all, but uh, was um, getting more important and, and, and visible through the last two years of the pandemic. And that's the One Health approach. And I think this is also something which goes very much align with the idea of the sustainable development goals, because this, this idea of global <laughs> One Health is also an underlying aspect that has to be um, regarded w when setting up uh, projects, when setting up new financial ideas, when setting up new economic strategies, um, because this uh, One Health approach gives us the chance to integrate these aspects. And I'm, I'm very happy that we in, in the ministry, in the German ministry, had the chance already to start some projects also looking at this uh, particular impact that One Health approaches can have on the sustainable development agenda. And uh, quite soon we will have also the opportunity to launch a multi-partner initiative in this context um, where we will hope to find um, um, partners to improve um, this approach further. So coming to an end, <laughs> thank you very much for, for listening. Um, from my point of view, as I, as I started with, it's, a, it's very uh, complex questions that you asked me, but I, and I, I think I could only highlight a few aspects of that, but I'm extremely happy to be in this round of panelists that um, have the uh, opportunity to, to give their different views to the same uh, um, aspect. And I think when taking all these aspects together, um, we have already um, made a great, uh, major step and I'm really, really thankful for inviting me and back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, if I may make uh, take it forward, uh, the two things that uh, you mentioned uh, that I would like to stress upon here. One is the One Health. Uh, uh, recently, or rather for the last two years, uh, me and uh, Dr. Mathur, who is going to speak next, uh, we have been working on a national mission for biodiversity and human well-being in India. One Health is one of the verticals. So one of the seven verticals. I have been looking after something called bioeconomy vertical. Uh, and we, we did look at and this is a team of natural scientists and social scientists have worked on this mission. And the systemic approach is something which all, all of us have understood that this is all which is required. And uh, hopefully, uh, Dr. Mathur, over to you. Hopefully we will hear something from you because you have been the NBA chairperson and you have worked with WII before. Uh, and we, talk, we did talk about this uh, access benefit sharing and sharing of uh, the value with the local communities and all that. We would like to hear from you that uh, how important is the valuation or valuing of biodiversity by the people uh, who are closest to the resources? Um, is it really required? Over to you, Dr. Mathur. Thank you, Nandan, for uh, bringing up this issue of values. And uh, I do understand that uh, the perception of value is the first starting point for any action. Because unless we perceive the value in the right measure and in the right term, we cannot initiate action both in our personal and professional lives. So after discussions, I started looking at uh, these big targets the IG biodiversity targets, it's a different matter that we have not been able to achieve. But if we start looking at that and try to relate them to the value system, we realize that the IG target one and two, both of them talk about values. Values that the people are aware that biodiversity exists 
and steps have to be taken to conserve and to use it. See, the emphasis is very clear. It's not just conservation, it is use as well. And then the larger value is that it is integrated into the larger national and local development planning processes. So this is what the IG target says. And then like all countries or many countries, India also framed its national targets. So we looked at the IG 20 targets, we framed our 12 targets. And here I want to focus that uh, when we were looking at values, we started focusing on the youth because that is where the future lies. We have one of the highest or maybe the highest population of youth in the world. And we realize that when we are talking of biodiversity conservation, it is the youth that we need to sensitize with. And that is where target number one of the National Biodiversity Target of India talks of that. And of course, these have to be then integrated into the larger planning processes and the SVSAPs and so on and so forth. But then coming to SDGs, here again, the value system operates in a different manner. It talks about uh, building a just and equitable society. And it also talks about uh, having values that there are no gender inequalities in any form. And the most important value, if I can say so, is to ensure that no one is left behind. The point I'm making is that values are very important and they are the first trigger for any action on ground. And therefore, now when the world is talking about the global biodiversity framework, there is a mention there that by 2050, see, it's very interesting. We have been talking and dealing with biodiversity. Still, we are saying that by 2050, another 20 years, 30 years from now, biodiversity is valued, conserved, restored, and used. So the point is very important that you made in this panel, in this track, that we need to have a firmer grip but then I come back to a very specific question of yours that what is what does valuing biodiversity mean by people who are very close to nature? They are the people who need to protect, preserve, conserve biological diversity and nature. But then I also want to share that there is a dynamics there. There is a challenge there. India, like many countries following the CBD, we prepared our Biological Diversity Act in 2002. And the purpose is very clear. We need to promote conservation. We want to have sustainable use. But very importantly, we want to document our biological diversity. And there can be no better document, I would say, than what we are calling as our People's Biodiversity Register. And to our audience, many of them, they know, but to reiterate that these registers have to be prepared at the local level of governance. In, in Hindi or in Indian system, we call them Gram Panchayat. And obviously what these registers contain, if we are to manage our resource, if we are to trade our resource, then we must know where that resource is, what that resource is, what is the quantity. And in the present context of climate, affecting everything, we need to look at what the floral aspects are going to change, how the faunal aspects are going to change, and very, very importantly, the traditional knowledge systems. This is something which Government of India, the Ministry of Panchayati Raj, Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, and my own authority at NBA are looking at it, that we must have a firmer handle of these attributes. Because if we don't have then we will not be able to protect and preserve for all times to come. And look at the magnitude of the task. We are now talking of not one, two, three. We are talking of 265,000 plus, which have to be prepared or under preparation. Because if you don't do that, we will never be able to manage our resources properly and effectively. But the challenge now, let me spell it out. These documentation that I talked about is paper based. These are sheets and sheets of papers, which we call them PBR. But now we have realized that a paper based PBR can offer many things, but also cannot offer a large number of things. And with the digital India moving 
on we are now in the process of converting them into electronic registers and you did mention a little while there is a national mission on biodiversity and human well being led by the prime minister science technology innovation advisory council it is looking at these national missions which is about to be launched and as a part of this mission you talked about verticals this is another vertical which we have called as nisarg bharat which is a national initiative for sustained assessment of resource governance because this is something which we need to put in place in as comprehensive manner as possible but while it is our goal we realize that this transition from paper based pbr into an electronic pbr is a formidable challenge whole range of technical issues are involved which provide constraint but i must share with you as a scientist it is the mindset issues which dominate why should i share what should i share what will i get out of sharing will somebody run away from my data all these issues are so very important and that is why i have clubbed them under mindset issues so this in by uh, dialogue has to be in contextualized in the context of these mindset and technological constraints and lastly i would say that we do have a way ahead valuing biodiversity in a very clear in a very concise and simple manner is the critical first step both for conserving and you use the word augmenting biodiversity we don't want it to remain static all the time for all the time we need to augment it but that can happen when you start valuing them but there is a rider the process and the outcome should be clear it should be concise it should be simple very easily understood by the man or the local community and therefore i would say that when we talk of promoting a nature positive green recovery from the pandemic we need to use a combination of approaches we do need to have an elaborate macro level planning which our ministry of statistics and program implementation and others are doing but we need to dovetail it with very efficient grassroots actions which is what the pbrs do which is what we at nba and with the state biodiversity boards are doing i will perhaps stop here give it back to you and if there are any questions we will be very happy to take them on so back to you uh thank you thank you dr mathur of uh, highlighting the importance of uh, valuing biodiversity by the people and what are the challenges that uh, are there in terms of uh, reducing or, or converting the pbrs to be pbrs we are all aware of that it is thanks for sharing to the general audience uh, uh if i may uh, request uh, the next speaker uh who is from international chamber of commerce and i have a connected question on the value the dr mathur emphasized uh, on the requirement or the necessity of valuing biodiversity at the grassroots so my question to raylin martin who is the head of sustainability in the international chamber of commerce said how important or how important is the the role of businesses in communicating responsible and credible environmental information because at the end of the day the value as you, as they say that beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder so the value of the biodiversity has to be trusted or the valuation by an environmentally conscious consumer of the biodiversity depends on the trust that is there on the information so dr mathur spoke about people are refusing to even reveal information and we are talking about trusted information or information communicated to the consumer so that the consumer can trust that and and value it and decide and and and, and, and uh, then uh, decide to promote it and consciously and so on and so forth so over to you relin so we would like to hear uh, dr mathur can you uh, stop the presentation please thanks over to you relin you can go ahead Thank you very much for inviting me to speak today on this very important topic. 
And thank you to my fellow panelists for their very rich perspectives uh, that we heard earlier. So I'm quite honored to be here today on behalf of the International Chamber of Commerce as the world's largest business organization with over 45 million members from the private sector. And ICC is also the only private sector organization to be admitted to the United Nations Generally, General Assembly as a permanent observer. So, so thank you very much for your question, which I will try to address in a twofold approach. Uh, firstly, sort of outlining the role of business with respect to biodiversity conservation and promoting that in business practices. And then secondly, focusing on how those communications on biodiversity can be responsible and credible. So there's certainly increasing recognition by business on the importance of biodiversity as a key sustainability issue, even if it's not still yet as high on the agenda as climate change. Companies are becoming more aware of the impacts and dependencies on biodiversity, and they need to manage these to ensure that they decrease any negative impacts, as well as increase positive impacts going forward. So we really urgently need to accelerate the transformation of economic, social and financial models to halt and reverse biodiversity loss. And the role of business is essential in this process as a source of finance, as a driver of innovation and technological development, and as a key engine of economic growth and employment. Companies are already taking steps to integrate biodiversity considerations into their strategies, their operations, innovations and investments, but much more needs to be done to leverage the energy capacities and the expertise of the business community and scale up its actions as an actor for positive change. And one key driver of this process will be the, the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework, which is currently being negotiated under the, the CBD. And an ambitious, clear and workable framework would help guide and enable businesses to become positive actors for biodiversity and also trigger the necessary policies that will be essential to support and incentivize more businesses to embed biodiversity values into their decision making. We know that it takes both business action but also the right enabling frameworks. And ICC has been engaging with the UN Convention on Biological Diversity for a number of years now and is working to ensure that this vital international discussion will enable business to deliver solutions that will effectively address the challenges of biodiversity loss and promote sustainable use of the world's biological resources. So a clear apex goal and actionable targets supported by a strong and coherent enabling policy environment are really quite fundamental to push this agenda forward. We need to align private and public financial flows to incentivize investments and decisions that increase positive impacts on biodiversity and discourage those with negative impacts. And ICC certainly does recognize the urgency of addressing continuing global biodiversity loss. And our aim is to mobilize our network to mainstream biodiversity within the broader business community. This will requ require that the value of nature for people and the economy become more visible and that business leaders take into account both their impact and dependency on biodiversity and have sustainable business practices. And we're quite committed to leveraging our vast network and positioning within the UN to help address the, the biodiversity challenges that we collectively face. So it is certainly clear that, that nature is intrinsically linked to climate change. Nature-based solutions are a fundamental part of action on biodiversity and climate action is at the center of the strategy in helping to address climate change. Thriving natural environments are essential to the health and prosperity of communities and the global economy at large. And so at COP26, nature was on the agenda and a topic of negotiations more than ever before. And we have seen major commitments on forest and land use. And this is certainly an important development as we know that nature has a key role to play if we are to achieve those goals and to successfully adapt to climate change. But the business community, of course, has a very strong role to play in halting diverse biodiversity loss and uh, human existence, of course, depends on the balance in the natural ecosystem. And we must look at nature in a holistic way and in the context of the 17 SDGs. So we'll be coming to, to the point, second point of the question, really moving on to the aspect of communications. And I'll try and elaborate a little on, on responsibly communicating environmental information and or efforts on supporting biodiversity. 
Uh, there's certainly increased interest by media, governments and consumers about the impact of human activities on the environment, which has also put the spotlight on environmental marketing claims. The marketplace has seen a proliferation of environmental claims as businesses seek to promote the environmental attributes of their products, as well as communicate their climate actions with the broader public. And this includes, amongst others, the effects of products or packaging on wildlife and biodiversity. So as consumers become more interested in the environmental footprint and impact of the products they buy, ICC has actually developed a framework for responsible environmental marketing communications to help marketers evaluate environmental communications to maintain consumer confidence in these claims. Helping businesses get these messages right is a real core objective of the framework. It helps marketers craft environmental messages that adhere to the basic global principles of truthful, honest, and socially responsible communications. And whilst those principles behind environmental marketing are simple, applying them to new claims and terms that are not universally understood and making sense of available data and science adds a level of, of complexity. But the framework does try to map that process and outline the basic rules of the game without eliminating the legitimate uh, merits of the product being advertised. So I think some of the key roles of the road I would like to highlight is that environmental claims such as biodegradable, recyclable, microplastics free must be truthful and not misleading, must be substantiated by a reasonable basis, qualified to prevent deception and clear as to the benefits of products, packages and services. We also have addressed some aspirational claims that I'm not going to detail about because I know we're running out of time. But just to basically note that uh, companies are communicating aspirational claims to reflect environmental commitments or goals they int intend to achieve in the future, such as net zero by 250 or 2030 biodiversity goals. And these should be able to concretely demonstrate the approach that's being used to enable them to meet those commitments. And so the ICC framework really is designed to help walk businesses through the process to maintain a focus on how consumers might interpret a particular advert or claim. I'm going to close, uh, close right there and probably just to say that um, collaboration with the business community is essential in this process and that all stakeholders should work together with business as a true partner towards our common goals. So I'm going to close and just thank you once again for the, to the organizers and to the representatives on today's panel for a truly engaging discussion and the opportunity to contribute some business perspectives. Thank you so much. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lelin, that uh, this, uh, and uh, actually thank you all. We have, uh, we have nearly exhausted our time. Um, uh, I think uh, the the organizers, the well, the tech team wants us to show all of us together. Uh, in the process, uh, let me thank all of you uh, for intensely engaging with the subject matter uh, that uh, we propose to all of you. Thank you all for agreeing to speak on the matter that we propose to you without any hesitation. I must give full credit to Nivedita, who introduced me to all of you, for organizing, communicating with all of you, and Shelly Kedia for guiding us all through. Uh, we must thank the sponsors once again for the, this particular panel, BMUView, as well as IKI, as well as my host institution, Terry Sass, just not to forget. Uh, and thank all of you for uh, really enriching discussions. And I must say that uh, certain things become very, very clear in terms of uh, what we wanted to showcase to the audience or the viewers is in terms of the importance of action now, importance of action on nature in the entire agenda of economic development, which is a subject which I teach actually. And I would definitely use some of your quotes in the next class for sure. Uh, it's a course called Environment and Economic Development. Uh, uh, I think on that note, I, I hand it over to the tech team if you want us to do anything. Otherwise, we will just close it. Okay, fine, fine. 
so thank you on that note uh, thank you all uh, good afternoon and uh, good morning have a good day and good night from all of us thank you thank you thank you